Well, in my, in my past life, I have never been around or tended to the care of sheep. Now, maybe some of you have. Maybe you have been sheep herders since many years ago. But I haven't. And I confess ignorance in the physical raising of sheep and so forth. Now, I've seen many pictures and videos of sheep grazing the hills with their shepherds. A very beautiful, peaceful scene, usually. In that great storehouse of information out on the web, Wikipedia, uh, I found the following under the word shepherd. It defined a shepherd as one, as a person who tends, herds, feeds, or guards herds of sheep. The word shepherd is derived from sheep herder. It's just a sh shortened version. The article went on to say that sheep herding is among the oldest of occupations. Sheep have value in their milk, their meat, and especially their wool. To maintain large flocks of sheep, they must be able to move from pasture to pasture. In times past, the raising of sheep was many times on rugged, hilly areas. And because of that, it was helpful for the shepherd to have a strong stick or staff or crook to balance himself on the hills to maybe help recover a sheep that had fallen or maybe even defend the animal from attack. The Bible has many references to shepherds and their sheep. The most important of those references is used metaphorically, that being the great God, Jesus the Christ, as our spiritual shepherd watching over us as his sheep. Christ indeed does care for us. And as we journey this Christian, as we go, you know, and follow the Christian journey, he pledges to be our shepherd. He pledges to guide us and to protect us and to feed us. He, he promises to do all the things that a shepherd is defined as doing. And he will do it by the power of his might. We are part of God's flock, and we look to him for green pastures, and we look to him also for salvation. I want to talk this morning, or rather this afternoon, isn't it? Hopefully all of you are getting adjusted to 2 o'clock, 2.30 over here. We had to mentally think about that ourselves, not to leave the house too, too soon. But this afternoon, I want to talk about the shepherds that watch over us. And even though I don't personally have any physical experience in herding woolly sheep, I understand, and I believe you do too, the spiritual parallels of God being our master and our chief shepherd. I've entitled this message, The Shepherds in Our Lives. So let's start in Matthew chapter 2, verse 4. Matthew chapter 2, verse, verse 4. And we'll see that even as a newborn baby, Jesus' destiny was already set. We'll start in verse 4. And when he, that is King Herod, had gathered all the chief priests and, and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Verse 5, And they said to him, and they were quoting from Micah chapter 5, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, 
but you, Bethlehem, is in the land of Judea, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So here we see a prophecy that Christ would become a ruler and a leader of the people and become a shepherd to them as well. Later, as a grown man, Jesus confirmed being a shepherd in his own words. We see that in John chapter 10. Let's turn to John chapter 10. We'll read a good deal of this chapter. Christ is speaking here. He's talking to the people. John chapter 10, and let's start down in verse 11, and then we'll kind of jump around a little bit. Verse 11, John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, and Christ has died for each one of us. But a hireling, or a paid worker, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep. And remember, Christ has purchased each one of us with his blood. He owns us as his sheep. He's bought us. Sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hurling flees because he is a hurling and does not care about the sheep. Verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Christ, Christ truly, we see that Christ truly cares and loves each of us. We need to return his love by being a faithful member of that one flock and that one shepherd. Verse 17 now. Verse 17. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again, that is, be resurrected back to life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. So, in these previous verses, we see a very dedicated, a very loyal shepherd, willing to lay down his life for the flock. Jesus has an investment in each one of us. No matter how stubborn, how unfaithful, unfaithful we become at times, we have a good shepherd who loves us, who provides for us, who comforts us, feeds us on spiritually green pastures. Let's go back up to verse 1 of John 10. Verse 1. Verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So Christ is the door. Christ is the entryway to the sheepfold. Verse 3, to him, that is the shepherd, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. We might ask, do we? Do we know the true voice of God's word when we hear it? 
Do we know the word of God? Verse 5. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And so, again, we might ask, do we know when something is strange to God's word, when something doesn't sound right and it's not confirmed by God's word? Verse 6, Jesus used this illustration, but they, the people listening at the time, the Jews, all who heard him, he wasn't talking only to his disciples at this point. They did not understand the things which he spoke to them. You know, it went over their heads. They didn't have the mind to understand. Many times, if not most, of the words of Christ went over the heads of the people. They didn't make any sense to him, uh, to them. Christ spoke of a time that was way off ahead in the future to them that they just couldn't grasp. Verse 7, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. And some translations in the Bible say gate door or gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life. And usually when Christ speaks the word life, he's talking about our spiritual life to come. He's not talking about our physical life. You know, in one sense, we haven't even entered real life yet. You know, the real life to come is the life that Christ came to reveal and, and going on and, and that they may have it more abundantly. So again, our spiritual life to come will be much more abundant than what we have in this physical life today. It's only a type of a greater living experience to come. Salvation comes by entering through the door, through the shepherd. And we know him by his voice, by the words he speaks, not by his form. We don't recognize him by his form because we can't see him yet. We will someday. But we know him by his faithful spoken word. And with his spirit, uh, coupled by his, with his spirit within us, giving life to those words. You don't need to turn there, but in John chapter 17, Christ says, Your word is truth. In John 14, John, Christ, uh, Jesus said to, to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, let's finish, finish up our time in John 10 by going down now to verse 25. Verse 25, John 10, same chapter. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, that they shall never perish and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. 
I and my Father are one. So those who are true sheep of God, of Christ, those who are truly called and chosen and faithful, are those who hear God's voice through His Word. They can read the Word of God and it, their mind has been opened to say, yes, that is truth. I understand. And so they hear His voice through God's Spirit, through the Word of God, and they understand it. And even more, they live it. They put it into practice. They don't throw it aside, but they live it. And we know that God is calling his first fruits today. Many who do occasionally come and attend services with us and walk through those doors over there and, and visit us and who have read the Good News magazine and maybe seen the Beyond Today broadcast may not yet fully hear the voice of the shepherd as we hear him. See, they're maybe just curious. They're interested. But they may not quite hear that vo same voice that we hear. And as a result, they do not continue in their fellowship with us. If they hear the voice and recognize it and understand it, then they will continue in their fellowship with us. It's just maybe not their time. Just as most, and have you ever thought about this, that most did not believe the direct words of Jesus Christ when he walked the earth in flesh. I mean, they were so close to God they could rub up against him and touch his flesh. But his words didn't sink in. They, they couldn't hear the voice. It, it just was not their time. And some may have chosen, no, this is a crazy man. Doesn't know what he's saying. And of course, there was a time in our past, in our life, that we didn't hear the shepherd's voice either. But at the appointed time, God allowed us to hear his voice and kind of wake up. And that we could understand and read the word of God, and it made sense. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 now. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 21. First Peter 2.21 for, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you and all of us here should follow his steps. Verse 22 who committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness. By whose stripes you were healed. And that's a complete healing of, of physical, e mental, emotional healing. Verse 25, For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You know, Christ died and suffered for each of us. He is our shepherd, the overseer, the guardian of our spiritual lives. Guardian is a good word uh, for overseer. Some translations have the word guardian. 
We've all gone astray at times. Yet we know that there is great comfort and safety in the presence of the shepherd to be close to his voice. God cares for us and desires greatly that we look to him for continual guidance as we travel the rocky ground and the pastures of this perverse world. The biblical analogy of the shepherd and sheep is so fitting for us in our daily Christian walk. A true and caring shepherd is what we need to steady us, to calm us down, to give us guidance in these perilous times. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 13, towards the very end of the book of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20, verse 20. Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, our duty as sheep is to do the shepherd's will, to submit our lives to him. King David clearly understood the analogies of sheep and a shepherd. David shepherded his father's flocks when he was young. We've read those, those stories. David uh, defended those flocks against lions and bears. Very protective of the sheep. Was willing to die for the sheep. And David used that experience to write probably one of the most quoted of all psalms. And in this psalm, David applies the comparison of God being our shepherd. A shepherd that guides and protects and is always with us. Let's turn to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Again, one of the most read of all psalms. Written by David. A man experienced with sheep and being a shepherd. Verse 1. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want or lack anything. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still and quiet waters. He brings contentment into our lives. He restores my soul. He leads and guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You know, God will never lead us down the wrong path. God will never lead us into unrighteousness. He will always lead us into the path of righteousness. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They provide protection of the sheep. You prepare a table, maybe like a banquet table, before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, eternally, forever and ever. You know, this is a very comforting psalm, and we are God's sheep. Just as physical sheep can wander off and get lost, 
You know, we as believers can do the same if we lose sight of the true shepherd and the green pastures that he has provided for us. He's provided it all for us. But yet, we may choose to go down a different path. You know, our carnal nature tends to draw us away from those green pastures to follow the ways of this world. It's just in our nature somewhat to do that. To go a different path, to enjoy, as the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 2, you don't need to turn there, but to go out and experience and enjoy the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, how long could you and I survive in this evil world without our Good Shepherd? Probably not too long. One reference I read described some of the weaknesses that physical sheep have being on their own. This is their natural nature. And I believe there could be some spiritual analogies here for us. But this reference said that overall sheep do not have very good eyesight, nor do they even have the best of hearing. They are mostly slow animals who cannot easily escape a predator. They have no camouflage, no weapons to defend themselves such as claws or sharp hooves or strong jaws somewhat defenseless. Sheep can also become easily frightened and easily confused and just blindly follow one another. Where this sheep goes, they will follow. As true Christians, we may be easy prey for this world and for Satan unless we choose to stay close to the shepherd who owns us and can shield us and protect us. If we drift from the flock, if we allow ourselves to go astray looking for something new, we can endanger ourselves. Our nature tends to make us think that the grass is always greener over there. Or is it over there? It's always looking for something that's got to be better. In reality, it's best not to wander so far away where we cannot hear the shepherd's voice. The shepherd, that shepherd will supply all of our needs. We don't need to go out looking for something better. He will supply all of our needs and bring us peace and safety in green pastures. When David became king over Israel, he also became their shepherd. And let's notice that in 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 1. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are, your, we are your bone and your flesh. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, you, David, were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, David, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Verse 3. Therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign and he reigned 40 years. 
So David is king and shepherd now, a second duty, had to now guide Israel into the paths of righteousness. That's what a shepherd does. He, he feeds, he tends, he protects, he guides. David had to do all of that for the people. All the sheep of Israel were now his concern and in his care. And for many years, good things came to Israel because David honored God and obeyed God. However, those times ended and the one united kingdom split into the house of Israel and, to, and the house of Judah. And soon the house of Israel was made captive by Assyria. And this brought fear to the house of Judah. Psalm 80, which is not a psalm of David, was written in the context of these very fearful times. And Judah was afraid of being made captive, just like their, their brothers in, in Israel were. The people of Judah called out to God for divine help. So let's turn to Psalm 80, verse 1. And the people are talking to God. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. The people are entreating God to save them. You who lead Joseph like a flock. You who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh. Stir up your strength and come and save us. Restore us, O God, cause your, cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. And help did come for a while. But eventually all of Israel was made captive by their enemies. And God allowed this due to the gross unfaithfulness and the gross disobedience of the people. The kings after David quickly forsook God and his righteousness and departed from being any type of a serving shepherd over the people. They did not take on that role of being a shepherd over the people. And Israel faced troublous times in their captivity. But in Isaiah 40, comfort and good news is sounded. Let's turn there. Isaiah chapter 40. This chapter speaks of the coming of the one who would be the Christ. In both his first and second comings, in several places overlapping, the first with the second appearance. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says the God, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity, her sin is pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And we do know that John the Baptist cried out and announced the coming of the Messiah's first, first appearance. Now down to verse 10. Verse 10, Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for, rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. So here we see Christ returning a second time, again, as a shepherd, feeding his flock, gathering his lambs. 
his first coming, he said, I'm the good shepherd. His second coming, he's coming back as a shepherd again. And we, we picture all of this in Isaiah 40, this time of comfort and happiness every year as we gather for the Feast of Tabernacles. Yet even until that time comes in full reality and Christ will return at the appointed time, Christ is today still our Good Shepherd. He is the door and the voice that we follow. He is the one we look to for all of our spiritual and physical needs. We spoke of that earlier. After Jesus, after Jesus in the flesh had died and was resurrected, he met with the disciples several times. He was resurrected, yet he met with them before he went on to be finally with his father. Let's notice one of those occasions. John chapter 21. John chapter 21, verse 14. Verse 14. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Christ said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to them, to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep sheep. So three times Christ gave Peter an active instruction to feed and tend to God's sheep. Several translations use shepherd my sheep instead of tending my sheep. Very similar. Peter and by extension the other disciples were given the responsibility to be physical shepherds of God's flock, to care for and feed God's flock. For three and a half years, Jesus had set his disciples a good example of being a good shepherd over them who heard his voice every day. They were trained of what his voice was like. They saw the example of the Good Shepherd. And now with Jesus leaving them, the disciples were to be a guide and an example to the remaining believers. Those believers needed overseers. They needed examples. They needed to be shepherd. And they had the ones that Christ trained for three and a half years as their shepherds. Let's notice what Peter later said. So this was an experience that Peter had before Christ left them all. Let's go now to 1 Peter chapter 5. And Peter is writing here, looking back with the experience that he had, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, verse 1. And Peter says, The elders who are among you I exhort, or I urge, and appeal, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, 
and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Verse 2, shepherd, speaking to the elders in this letter that Paul is writing, shepherd the flock of God which is amongst you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion or under pressure, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, Christ, appears, that is at his return, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Peter wrote that our elders in the church are to be shepherds and overseers of the flock. They are to nurture and guide us all into the paths of righteousness. And the Apostle Paul spoke along these same lines. Let's notice that in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Verse 17, Acts 20. Now, here, Paul was making a trip to Jerusalem. And he stopped off in the city of Miletus. And we now come upon this scene in verse 17. From Miletus, he, Paul, sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And one reference in the Bible dictionary I looked up said that Ephesus and Miletus was about 37 miles apart. So they had a good little trip to go up and bring these elders down to Miletus. Verse 18, And when they, the elders, had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Now down to verse 28. Verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves, to all the flock, to the church of God, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers or guardians, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. I won't read any further, but Paul here was encouraging the area elders to be strong in shepherding the church and to be very aware of wolves and false teachers who would attempt to scatter the sheep. And of course, that's been good advice down through the centuries of God's New Testament church. There has always been and always will be until Christ returns false teachers and false shepherds alongside the flock of, of Christ, alongside the body of Christ. Christ will one day put an end to those who have evil and selfishness in their heart. Final scripture. A future time when many, many will be saved Let's go to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, verse 13. Then one of the elders, and this is a heavenly elder, not a physical, but a spiritual heavenly elder, answered, saying to me, to John, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? 
Verse 14, And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall never, they shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. Verse 17. For the Lamb, which is Christ, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So we see a time of no more sadness. And even as spirit beings, even after our change to spirit, Christ will continue to be our shepherd. Good times are ahead for those who let themselves be led and fed by the good shepherd, Jesus the Christ. Now, brethren, recently the physical shepherd that God had blessed us with for many years has moved on to tend a new flock. And that flock needed him. And we have received a new shepherd over us to pastor us, to guide us into green pastures of righteousness. The Greek word for pastor simply means shepherd. Yet, in this change of pastors, our goal in life really hasn't changed, has it? It remains the same to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness each day. God has provided shepherds in our lives to help us accomplish that goal of seeking his kingdom first, of pointing us to, always to the good shepherd, to Christ. So let's continue to worship God in strong faith, knowing that he will provide our every need as we need by his mighty staff.